Life After Death is one of the greatest life albums of all time. Overall, not only in heavy metal. Yes, that's true. Released on the 14th of October in 1985, Life After Death became the first full-length live album by Iron Maiden. And so, as a part of our Up the Iron series, let's first of all take a look at some of the most interesting facts about it, discuss what makes it so unique and innovative, and then hopefully answer the question whether this album was actually the pinnacle of Iron Maiden's career. Here you go. <laughs> quick before we start, as always, please do not hesitate to comment on anything you hear or see in this video. And especially if you disagree with me, because the whole point of our Up the Irons series is, of course, to start a conversation. But alright, let's do it. In 1984, Iron Maiden embarked on a massive world slavery tour in support of their then latest studio album, Power Slave. And the truth is that right off the bat, this tour was doomed to be nothing like anything Iron Maiden have done before. First of all, Power Slave became the first studio album which the band has recorded with exactly the same lineup as its predecessor. And according to Bruce Dickinson's interview from August in 1984, before even starting the tour, the band already knew that their next record was going to be a live double LP, since the permanent lineup was in fact the divine sign that the band has been waiting for in order to release their second live album. Yeah. Second, in case you're wondering, technically the first one is still made in Japan from 1981 and Beast over Hammersmith will not be released for another like 17 years. And maybe because of this fact that the stars aligned just right and by 1984 Iron Maiden finally settled on a permanent lineup while of course being on top of their game, Steve Harris and the team gave their absolute best on the road, with World Slavery Tour to this very day remaining the longest running tour in the Iron Maiden career, with a mind-blowing amount of 189 shows played. Wow. In addition, while the band did a headliner run a year earlier, World Slavery Tour became the first grand headliner world tour for Iron Maiden, with the band taking on the road thoughtfully designed and executed stage decorations and one-of-a-kind production. Thus, filming this occasion seemed at the very least the most logical thing to do. And so it seemed like every step of this tour was geniusly planned and flawlessly executed. Whether it was going behind the Iron Curtain for the very first time ever, explaining Eddie's resurrection after his death at Donington, or filming a massive live double LP. Or so it seemed. Most of the artists, knowing that they have to record a live show, try to do that towards the middle of the tour, when they're already warmed up enough and they know that their routine works, yet are not too tired to give their absolute best and Iron Maiden are, of course, no different. And thus, the original intention by the band was to film Live After Death back in London at the Hammersmith Audion, when the band had four back-to-back -back scheduled and sold-out shows. Well, we wanted to really record you know, all of it from Hammersmith, because it's home, but... Uh... You know. Both Steve Harris and Bruce Dickinson actually pointed out that they deliberately wanted this to be recorded in Europe. And don't get me wrong, not because they didn't like the United States, they love the United States, and in fact Americans actually brought them most of their financial success. Exactly. But according to Bruce Dickinson, because of the slight difference between the crowd's behavior and their attitude towards the rock bands on two different continents. For example, it's it's plain, plain, if we like for example Long Beach Arena in Los Trapati, in Long Los maybe uh, 20,000 Iron Maiden fans, the fans And so by the mid-October Iron Maiden gathered all of their strength and might to record the best possible Iron Maiden show. Only to find out after they did it that most of the footage they had was absolutely unusable. Bruce Dickinson later on pointed out that their lighting engineer, Dave Lights, was at some kind of war with the video guys, and so most of the footage was too dark to see absolutely anything. Although the concerts themselves were supposedly significantly stronger than the ones in California. And also there were four songs longer. Why, God, why? 
Bye. And so instead of using a non-usable recording from London, the band decided to absolutely re-record the show during another four nights of sold-out shows, this time at Long Beach, California. Tell me why. By the way, fun fact, Bruce Dickinson seems like always brings a little piece of England everywhere he goes. And yes, this does include this concert as well, as on the audio version of the album, which we will see in just a moment, is quite different from the video one. Just before Revelations, Bruce Dickinson says to the crowd, nice to see you, to see you is nice. Thus quoting Bruce Forsyth, the host of the popular in the 1970s British show The Generation Game, which of course would be absolutely unknown to most of the Americans. Nice to see you, to see you! Nice! I actually still have no idea why Bruce Dickinson says this to the American crowd, but there is at least one person in the venue whom he makes love. Himself. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, even though the band pointed out that the audio version of the London concerts are significantly stronger than the ones from California, I assume that the band decided to not go with those just to not confuse their fans and make this live album known as the one recorded at Long Beach, thus only placing the four missing songs on the fourth side of the audio LP. Although still, this of course did not make it any less confusing for their fans. I, uh... On the 23rd of October that same year, Iron Maiden fans realized that the video version of Live After Death is completely different from the one they heard just a little over a week ago, simply because of the fact that they were recorded on different nights. And I'll be very honest with you, while I do understand why the band decided to not go through with the London version, I'm still rather confused as per why did they decide to go through with the different audio and video versions of the show. As for me personally, there is not too much difference in the audio quality. Maybe because it was actually mixed by Martin Birch, who is known for some of the best live albums ever. But anyways, to this very day, many fans are actually puzzled by when exactly were the audio, video and London versions actually recorded. So let's try to get the record straight. When it comes to the American shows, it is actually pretty simple if you're simply attentive. As on the audio version of Live After Death, towards the end of the concert, during the song Running Free, Bruce Dickinson does his famous rant about how he wants California to leave him dead. Then he actually says that the crowds at nights number 1, 2 and 3 did not succeed in it, thus making it pretty obvious that this show was recorded on the last fourth night. I And on the video version, after performing two minutes to midnight, Bruce Dickinson actually plainly says that this is night number two. But I actually think it is safe to assume that the video version is actually a combination of at least two, but maybe actually all four nights at their shows in California. And when it comes to the shows in London, it becomes a little bit trickier and can be answered only with the help of the kids from the 1980s and their love for bootlegs. As after listening to some of them, I think it's pretty safe to assume that most of the recordings are from the night number one. Yeah, I know, I'm very nerdy. Nerd, nerd. But anyways, now that all of the records were straight, Iron Maiden were finally ready to release one of the best live albums ever. In order to provide the cover artwork for Live After Death, Iron Maiden once again of course invited their legendary artist Derek Ricks. Although the original version of the artwork was quite different from the one that we all know. The brief from the band said something like, we want Eddie coming out of the grave doing brrrr. And so Derek drew Eddie with the overall concept of the artwork being quite similar to the one we all know. In fact, Derek himself was not too fond of the final version, as on this one Eddie was coming straight at you, which in his opinion lacked motion and dynamics. Yet unfortunately for Ricks, the band's management absolutely loved it and actually approved the artwork despite Ricks' suggestions to redo it completely. And the truth is, it most likely would have made it on the vinyl if only it wasn't painted with oil paint, which turned out to be too shiny for it to be photographed and reproduced. And no matter how much did the photographers try, they couldn't make it work, resulting in Iron Maiden returning to Derek Ricks asking him to redo his work. Yeah, unbelievable. And so here I just wanted to say 
Thank God for the oils and oils and for the fact that they shine and are not suited for photographs. Cause yes, I personally love the final artwork million times more. So do all. On the updated and final version, Addy is not just rising from the grave, but is actually bursting from the ground just to be struck by lightning right away. The whole concept of course is related to the fact that Iron Maiden physically killed Addy at the end of their previous tour, thus resurrecting their mascot. The tombstone features a misquote from H.P. Lovecraft's The Nameless City, that is not that which can turn alive and with strange eons even death may die, replacing and with yet. Interestingly enough, the first version of the artwork featured that same quote, yet replaced and with but, which of course does not change the meaning much. Yes, it's true. The name on the tombstone reads Edward T. H., which of course is short for Edward the Hat, and his full name as it apparently is written in his passport. Among the writings on the tombstones in the back we can see Here Lies Derek Riggs R.A.P., which of course is just a joke by Derek, Let It Rip, which was the original title for Live After Death, which Derek has suggested to the band yet which has been rejected by Iron Maiden. Metal Lives, Thank You, Freedom of Rock R.I.P., which most likely refers to the famous PMRC case, which was in full swing that year, Live With Pride, which according to Derek Riggs refers to the band's desire to never lip sync at live shows, Here Lies Faust in Body Only, which is just a joke since according to the legend Faust sold his soul to the devil, and a bunch of other ones with not too much significance. What we also have here is of course the cat, which has been featured on almost every Derek Riggs painting and of which we spoke quite a lot in our previous episodes and most importantly the Grim Ripper, who seems to be helping destroy the city in the background. By the way, that landscape was highly influenced by John Martin's painting The Destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and given the city's skyline and the pyramids in the back, it can actually be speculated that it is the same city which we will later on see on Somewhere in Time album artwork, just once again proving that it is a freaking masterpiece which deserves praise just on its own. I love it! And so here's the thing. I actually firmly believe that Live After Death album artwork is one of the strongest Iron Maiden artworks from the 1980s. And it is partially thanks to this mesmerizing picture that audio and video versions of Live After Death were able to pick at number one and two in the United Kingdom. Although, of course, it was just one of the reasons for that. Live After Death did something almost impossible. It was able to capture the life, energy, power and vigor Iron Maiden had on stage. In a way, it did for Iron Maiden what Unleashed in the East did for Judas Priest six years before that, with millions of kids around the world wanting to not only buy their new albums, but also suddenly willing to travel miles and miles away just to see the band perform in life, knowing that it will be an insane show. <laughs> And back then, and actually even today, the fans spent hours closing their right and left ears just to be able to hear Adrian Smith and Dave Murray. Okay, maybe not everyone, but I still do that. Yeah, me too. And even more, fans around the world could not take their eyes off from the footage of those shows. And if we are being very honest, the band's masterful performance was not the only reason for that. Right, let me see those hands. Life After Death was actually light years ahead of its time in terms of filming and editing of the video part of the album. For the very first time in rock history you got to see the band from so many different angles. And this actually was not only thanks to the multiple cameras located in the van. Actually we had, I had one camera, it's called Rover and it's like on a, an arm. And so you could like actually cover like all the audience and the stage sort of thing, you know, like a wide angle lens on it. But most importantly, for the very first time ever, Iron Maiden provided not only the view from the different angles, but also significantly sped up the change of those frames, making the video actually coincide with the speed and power of their music. <laughs> It is today in the 21st century we are very much used to the high-paced video, but in reality back in 1985 this was absolutely revolutionary for live concert footage. In fact, despite this album's success, it will actually not become a standard for many years after that, still to this very day absolutely mesmerizing the viewer and making the kid in the mid-1980s actually feel like he's attending a concert while sitting in his living room in front of a TV. And 
And so yes, this, together with raw energy, masterful performance, and amazing sound, which and the band underlined that multiple times was not altered or dubbed in the studio, made Live After Death one of the greatest live albums of the 1980s. And at the same time, in my opinion, it did not become the pinnacle after which the band has gone downhill. Quite the opposite. It was the climax of everything the band has achieved in their early days. The climax of that early era of raw Iron Maiden, which has simply opened the gates to the new chapter of the band in which they did not have to prove anything to anyone anymore, as they truly have become one of the greatest heavy metal bands on the planet. But anyways, what do you guys personally think about Live After Death? And which is your favorite live album by Iron Maiden? Please let us know in the comments. I'm very curious to find out. But most importantly, guys, as always, I just want to remind you that the war in Ukraine in my country is still going on right now. And there are people dying here every day. So please continue supporting us in any way you possibly can. As most of you know, I'm running a volunteer group here on the ground in Kiev. So if you guys want to support us in any way, please do not hesitate to reach out to me directly. As always, thank you so much for watching this video, guys. Please do not forget to subscribe to this channel and we will prevail. Slava Ukraini!